Tonight, Lord, I pray that newness of life will be revealed to each of us through the reading, through the understanding, through the words that come from you in these pages of of scriptural history for each of us. I pray tonight, Lord, that through the reading and through the spoken word that your spirit will be poured out and poured into our lives and that we will find renewal. And silently and publicly, I pray tonight, Lord, that the me and me would be sent aside and that the you and me would speak through me so that your word might be shared and that all of my words would please you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. So we're really jumping ahead in Acts tonight. We're, we're going from where we were last week in the fourth chapter to the tenth chapter of Acts. And hopefully this has all been designed for a purpose to help us understand the important message of what it is in our life to be prepared and to be ready to bring on the Holy Spirit in every situation that we will encounter. One of the things that we will discover tonight is there is a great shift in what we have been talking about in earlier weeks. We basically had been talking about how the Holy Spirit worked through Peter and John and how that working of Peter and John affected others. And tonight, we almost take a real shift of how the Holy Spirit was working in somebody else and how it affected Peter. The first thing that I I think that it is important when we come, because this is so centered around prayer, that we must not only be prayers, praying for others, praying for situations, but we must stand in the place to receive prayers that are prayed for us. As an example, last week, the prayer focus that went along with the uh, fourth chapter of Acts was a call for prayer for pastors and for boldness of pastors and of church leaders. And I have been really intently praying for those pastors for that boldness. Uh, some who are friends, some who I have only heard are going through various situations. And to pray for church leaders that we are willing to stand for what is right as church leaders, to, that we are willing to stand for the gospel. And I could give you, if I wanted to name names this week, three different pastors that I witnessed a holy boldness in their lives. Uh, These are colleagues, friends that I have conversation with or observe. So I know it's important for us to not only be praying those prayers for boldness, but to also be ready to receive. Because I can tell you, I feel prayers uh, through certain situations, through certain ideas, and it, it comes a, a lot of times, someone will say, I've been praying for you, you know, and I think, well, I'm not going through anything, but uh, I, I feel those prayers, and we feel those prayers. Uh, there's an old story, um, I didn't want to go into this, but I, it come to my mind, so I want to share that there is a a story of a missionary who was in a very dangerous part of the world. And around the fire one night, 
could see a local group of people who had come to kill him. And he began to pray, and suddenly this group of people with no words, with no thoughts, left the area. A few days later, one of these people came to this missionary and said, we didn't know that you had an army around you. And he said, I I didn't have an army around me. Yes, you had ten people standing around the perimeter of your camp who would have overtaken me and the couple of people who were with me. And so we fled for our own lives. And he never thought anything about this, but he got back to um, his church and he said to this, uh, in this church, about shared this experience. And afterwards, there was a group of 10 people who had committed and coveted to come together every day and join in praying for him. And when they looked at the time, it was that exact time that they had gathered together to pray for this missionary that the idea was that they had surrounded this person in prayer and through that that spiritual eye, these ones who had come to kill him left. I don't know about you, but I think that's like not a coincidence you know, to hear that kind of thing. And so I think it's so important that we look at that not only as with boldness, but also being willing to pray for people, but to accept those prayers that are prayed for us. I I say this tonight because the situation that we're encountering in the 10th chapter If you open your Bibles and you follow along with me, you read in the 10th chapter about this uh, man by the name of Cornelius who was a centurion. And if we would be in the cheering, booing mode, you know, cheering for the good guys, booing for the bad guys, when we would hear the word centurion at that time, we would boo because he was one of the bad guys. He worked for the Roman government. It was his idea to end Christianity at that time, to to stop any kind of an effect that would change the people's minds other than to think about the Roman emperor and the Roman government. And here we read as an introduction about this man named Cornelius who was a devout man who feared God with and I think this is important also, with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed continually to God. The story goes on to say about the ninth hour, and it's interesting to me that a lot of stuff in Acts happens at that ninth hour, at that three o'clock in the afternoon time period. But at the ninth hour, while he was praying, while he was praying, he saw a vision. And in this vision, he received instruction to send people to bring Peter to him. And because of that, uh, he sent these three people, three or four people to, to find Peter who was in several towns over from him. And the scripture goes on to say, if you look at the ninth uh, verse, while Cornelius was having a vision, Peter at the same time was having a vision. And this vision was much different. It was this great white sheet was being dropped from heaven with all of the animals that Jews would have been forbidden from eating. And the words came from God, kill and eat. 
And even Peter questioned this. And you know, Peter was one who questioned a lot. Because he, because of Jewish custom, had never broke any of those rules. But here is God changing Peter's idea, Peter's mind, and even going contrary to what this Jewish law was all about him. And the story goes on to, to share where we really need to be tonight when uh, they find him, they invite him to come back with them to visit Cornelius. Now, there would have been a lot of skepticism here because certainly Cornelius was a Roman. He was non-Jewish. The biggest controversy that they were having at that time was over circumcision and non-circumcision. That the Jews, in order to gain salvation or to gain anything, had to be circumcised. And the Gentiles would not have had that same qualification, I guess, that they would not have had to. So he would have had to become unclean according to Jewish law in order to minister to Cornelius. And you can only think about Peter's mind here in this, this whole program. Well, God just told me that I can have pork chops for supper, so it must be okay for me to uh, speak, to, to talk uh, to this Gentile, to this Roman. And we get to the place in the Scripture where we also understand that in verse 28, in the lower half of verse 28, it says, But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. This is, I think, really poignant for us today in how we look at other people. Whether it is prejudice, to look at people of different colors, whether it is that we cannot consider a, a man or a woman to be different in how we uh, associate uh, with them, how we cannot look at people from other countries, we cannot look at people from other, and I want to be clear on this, Christian, God-centered religions, that we all become one under God of that same heart and that, that same mind and that same soul. And here's a, a big revolution within the life of Peter that he must now not just preach to the Jews, but he also must preach to the Gentiles. Up until this point, Peter would have only been preaching or directing his preaching, directing his care to the Jews. And now God has changed us all, saying there is no separation. You are called, you are called to preach to all people. Now when we, we look at the uh, importance of this, we need to come to the realization today in our own lives that we are to share the message with all people. We are to share the hope that we find in Jesus with all people. And that becomes very, very difficult for all of us. But it becomes essential for all of us. I, I want to just take you for a moment to Romans, to Romans chapter 3. And I, I think it's important to look at Romans chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, because it helps us 
uh, to answer these in, in verse 30. Hear these words, beginning in verse 28 in Romans chapter 3. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. But the new law is that the faith of Jesus Christ is available to all people, not just for us. And far too long, I think, in the church, we have been concerned with looking for people who look like us, have our same interests, and who act like us. But there is a whole realm of people out there who I really believe are searching for Jesus, and it becomes our responsibility to share, to share that. Now, what happened? What, what took place in the midst of this? While Peter is preaching to Cornelius and all of the people that he had gathered there, to his family, to his friends, to his neighbors who had gathered there to hear the great Peter preach. It says in verse 44 that while Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So, we can't question, I don't believe, how God is working in other people's lives. We can't discount what God is doing. And, and realizing that our God loves us all, provides us all, 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 the whole world, all people, with the same opportunity to experience and to understand this saving grace that is available to all people. So you might say tonight, so what is the idea about moving into a new house? We believe, or we should be believing, that our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit, is a house for the Holy Temple, for the Holy Spirit to reside in. That's scriptural. And so, I think that a lot of times in our spiritual house, uh, we have a lot of stacked up stuff. We have a lot of hidden compartments that we try to hide everything. And so, spiritually, I believe it is time that we move into these new houses within this, this temple, within this, this home of God, uh, which is our heart, which is our soul, so that we can fully understand what God wants to do and how God wants to move. And it will be then that we will start to experience a movement through prayer, through praying for every household, as we continue to do, praying for uh, businesses within this town. It is a planting of seeds. Uh, this week I heard about a place that one of the door hanger hangers uh, was afraid to go to. And the very next day, uh, because that door hanger hanger was faithful and took a door hanger to that place, the very next day, that person said to me, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened. Uh, and to see that, that heart 
softened. Because this statement has been made, we're praying for you. Uh, we want to offer you care. And it has opened up many new uh, conversations with us. And so as we continue to be people of prayer this week, we ask that you would consider in your prayer time to pray boldly so that for those who are ready to hear like Cornelius was, that there will be those of us who are ready to tell it like Peter did. We pray, we will pray diligently for the Holy Spirit to draw new persons, new households into the believing kingdom of God, into the trusting kingdom of God. And in that, we will embrace that scripture from 1 Thessalonians 1.5 that says, because the gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, that we will begin to see revival. And so I... I want you right now just to please close your, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to think of one person, maybe who is like Cornelius, who needs to hear the gospel message. If you can think of two or three, which I think we can, Tonight, Lord, while these persons are thinking of that one, we pray that your Holy Spirit right now is interceding and will speak to them. We pray that someone will be sent to them to share the gospel to share the love of Jesus that is offered to them. Pour your Holy Spirit into this right now, Lord. And likewise, Lord, we pray for households where there is confusion, where there is disarray, where there is pain. Let's think of those households without judging that we know exist. And we pray tonight, Lord, with a new spirit for a new household to come from these places, for families that will urgently want to come together and hear the good news, whether it be to this church or to another church or to some other ministry, we are praying right now for the move of your Holy Spirit within these households. Do your work, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus tonight that we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.